Well, good morning, Coastline family. It is great to see you guys today, and uh, I'm so excited to bring the word. I've been looking forward to this Sunday for a lot of reasons, but really the big one is the opportunity to open the Bible, to get, in it, to, uh, to get into it together. And I do pray today that as you leave, there will be something in your heart that says, you know, I'm so glad I was at church today. There was something specific for me in my life, and I think we're going to be helped and encouraged. We're really finding quite a guide to growth as we make our way through this study. In the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, we're finding attributes of those who ascend. We've taken the title for this study right out of the word here, and we've called this series, Let Us Rise. And really, it's good to know how to rise up when you're living in a world that seeks so often to put you down. We've observed to this point, Nehemiah was a man that rose up in prayer with him. That's where it all began, communing with God, time with God. In fact, four months he spent just going to God in prayer. Following that, we saw that he rose up in faith. He had a great confidence in God, so much so that his faith led him to work. And he was a man that believed greatly. He rose up in wisdom. He wanted to take time to listen and to learn before he sought to lead. And he had wisdom in that regard. So often we can be people of prayer, we can be people of faith, and practically we're not sure how to make a relationship work or, or this or that. We, we need wisdom. And that comes as you listen and you learn to God in particular. And then we saw that he rose again in commitment. He had to encounter critics, and we all will. And uh, each of these areas, it's so very, very important. But I would imagine that many of you in here today are like me in the sense that you've had times in your life where you started out well, you had the great intentions, but somewhere along the way, you, you kind of sputtered to a stop, you lost the motivation. Uh, I know that I've had areas like that in my life. Again, maybe you can relate. I'm thinking of projects around the house that... Only about half done. I'm talking about that guitar I got to learn how to play the guitar, and it's been in the corner picking up dust for many, many years now. I'm, I'm thinking of a lot of books I have that about halfway through I've got a bookmark, and that's probably where that bookmark is, is going to stay. Um, and, and I think you all know what I'm talking about. Maybe for you, it's that degree or just a few credits short of. And you've been saying for a long time now, I need to finish those credits up and finish that degree. Maybe that's uh, something where you came far, but you stopped short of the goal. Maybe it's that work needed to get the promotion on your job and you've stopped short of, of doing that. Maybe for you, it was a Bible reading plan that did not survive even the month of January. And something in your heart is saying, you know, I knew I needed to do that. I made the commitment to do it, and I've stopped along the way. And friends, what I want you to understand today before we get into the Word is this. The habit of not finishing things in life is seldom compartmentalized to one area. Typically, people who quit halfway through... Uh, it, it's, it's something that goes to every corner of our life. It's a dangerous way to live, to only go halfway and then stop. For if you live that way, your life will have only been half lived. None of us want that. God has a great life for us to live, and we want to live it to the fullest. We want to accomplish all that God would have. And while the reasons for stopping before a thing is done may be many, there's a big one we're going to discuss today, and it's the lack of courage. The lack of courage. Now, yes, there are times where between where we are and the goal to which God is sending us, there's something specific. I mean something visceral that is causing great fear to come to our hearts. But I think more times than not, rather than some item or some person or some object that's inflicting great fear, I believe many times when I say that we're lacking courage, it's because of discouragement. Discourage just means to lack courage. And, and life has a way, yes, at times it can just paralyze us by fear in that very visceral, tangible way. But, but oftentimes it's just the gradual lessening, weakening of the courage in our lives. And it brings us to a point where we're without courage. And the word for that is to be discouraged. We lost the drive. We lost the sense of purpose. We lost the motivation we once had. And friends, listen, if courage is what we lack, <clears throat> and we all do at times, that encouragement is what we need. I love to define the word encourage this way, to put courage in. Discourage, without courage, encourage, to have it put back in. And so what we need to do in the course of life is to discover, how can I get that courage put into my life? And, and that was a lesson Nehemiah had to learn. And it's a lesson that we'll see him understand in this passage we're going to study this morning. He was confronted with a situation that seemed to take the enthusiasm right out of his life and the lives of those working with him. But thankfully, they rallied 
and they finished the job that, had, that God had for them of rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And uh, really, the lessons that they leave in this text for us, it provides like a process, a path that will help us to grow in the course of our lives. I'd like to invite you, if you're able today, to join me in standing uh, as we read God's word together. If you're glad to be at church, say amen. amen. The music was great today. We're having a good day, and I am glad to be uh, bringing you this text this morning. We're looking to Nehemiah chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 6. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. The Bible says, So built we the wall, and the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Now we're going to read some more, but before we go on, a couple things I want to pull out of this verse. Uh, the wall's about halfway done. The wall was joined together to the half thereof. It's a dangerous place to be in life when we're at the halfway point of any endeavor, all right, where we've got to evaluate. I know what it's taking me to get here. It's going to take at least that to get there. The halfway point's a dangerous point. I also want you to notice this group had seen the progress they had. We see in this verse because the Bible tells us they had a mind to work. Coastline church family, listen, I'm going to tell you what's required in any church that is used greatly of God. A group of people that have a mind to work. Now, it is all done by the power of God. It's all to be done for the glory of God. But there, there should be a group of people that says, you know something? If there's something that needs to be done that will advance the cause of Christ, count me in. Now, that'll look different for everybody. Jeremy mentioned, and I'm grateful that he did, that not only do we have Easter coming up, but before that, exactly one month from today, we have this team night. It's going to be a great night. It's for all those involved currently in ministry, for all those who'd like to be involved in ministry. It's for everybody who would say, you know something, if Easter is the day people are more likely to receive an invitation for, I want to be on the team to do all I can to help our church and to get the message out and to welcome people when they come. And we want to make sure that we're the kind of people that, like we read about in this verse, we have a mind to work. Verse 7. I say, Pastor, if you went that long on one verse, good night. It's going to be a long one. We'll pick up the pace a little bit. Verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth. They got mad and conspired, all of them together, to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. There's much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. And, and our adversary said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. It came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon us. Therefore, said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, listen, be not ye afraid of them. He, he's addressing this spirit of fear that is seen in a life that misses courage. And this next statement's profound. He said, remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. In other words, he's a mighty God. And, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. It was personal. They got back to work. I want you to go please to the midst of verse 14, and I just love that statement. Remember the Lord. What happens when fear comes in? What are we to do? Well, we're going to see this developed, but it begins with a heart that says, this would be a great time to draw close to God. Remember the Lord. Now, Father, again, we're so thankful uh, for this time, for your word. God, I, I praise you for inspiring your word. I thank you for your sovereign hand of guidance that has preserved your word. And we pray now that God the Spirit would reveal your word so that we may learn it, live it, apply it. God, may we leave here different for what we uh, uh, see in your word today. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Every year in the state of Minnesota, about four dozen people get together and they embark on a race. It's run in the month of January. Uh, it, it's an event that is called the St. Croix Winter Ultra Marathon. It's, it's a 40-mile run in all of the winter conditions. It's a race that is run at night, as I said, in January, and as I also said, in the month of, of Minnesota. Now, as they're in the midst of this race, dealing with all the elements that that part of the country can throw at you in that time of the year, they're pulling a sled behind them with no less than 30 pounds of gear. Most of the runners make the 24-mile mark. Most of them will arrive sometime between 10 and midnight, and there's something that has to happen at the 24-mile mark before you can go on. You see, the rest of the race is, is really so far out in the boonies, you're on your own, and they want to know something about you before you leave the 24-mile mark, so the, there they have a little test. You have to go to your sled, and you have to take of your provisions and set up a one-man tent, put your sleeping bag in the tent, climb in the tent, get in the sleeping bag, and zip the door closed. If you can't do that, they won't let you go on to the rest of the race. And so people come and they get their gear and they set up their little one-man tent and they put the sleeping bag in, they climb in, they get in the sleeping bag, they zip the door closed and they say every year it's almost the same percentage for 25% of the runners, that's where their race stops. You think, well, that seems like such a simple task. I know, but if you're tired and you're freezing cold and you get in a tent and start to warm up, you might think to yourself, this would be a good place to call it a race. Now, I've never run an ultra marathon in Minnesota in January. I'd, I'd like to take it a step further. I hope to never run an ultra marathon in Minnesota in, in January. I, I don't want to do that. But I have something in common with these racers. I've been at mile marker 24 a lot of times in my life. That point where I'm pursuing something that God has for my life. And, and I get to a point and you begin to evaluate what will be required to move forward. I, I know what that's all about. I know what it is to have excitement in the beginning of a thing. And to get a bit worn down and beat up and discouraged. And to find myself cuddled on the side of the road in a sleeping bag. Instead of making the miles that God has built me to make for his glory. And I think that's not too different than what we find happening in Nehemiah's life. Nehemiah had dealt with critics, and as we learned last week, we're all going to deal with critics. That's, that's just part of it, but we see at times there are these pathological critics. They're not content to sit on the sidelines of life and just hurl their insults with you as you pass them by because they're inert in your emotion. There are those that really just set about in life to pursue you, and they become an obstacle that threatens your progress. They become uh, the source of, of distraction to the point that you cease moving forward. And, and two of the critics that we met last week were these men we read of today, Sanballat and Tobiah. And they rose to the point where they were no longer just critics in a verbal sense. They became a, a legitimate, uh, they became a credible threat. And these were men, I want you to understand this, that hated God. And because they hated God, they hated the people of God. And because Nehemiah was numbered among the people of God, they hated him. Friends, I want you to understand that if you're going to seek to live for God in your life, you will face opposition because we live in the midst of a spiritual warfare. And sometimes it's helpful for us just to be reminded it's not always personal. At times, if you're living the Christ life, that is Christ in you, what they despise most about you is just that, Christ in you. In fact, Jesus in John 15 said this, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you seek to follow Jesus in your life, there will be resistance in that, in, in that spiritual way. Now, Nehemiah got off to a good start. They they found, however, their opponents took it to a whole new level. I remember thinking I'd reach a point in ministry where uh, I'd kind of uh, uh, get beyond uh, dealing with criticism and, and critics, and, and that's just wrong. None of us get to that point in life. I, I want you to know, you never do grow out of that kind of opposition. The great news is this, you can grow through it. It doesn't have to be the end of the story. That can be a place where God has a lesson for you to gain now, these enemies, we read in verses 7 and 8 that it came to pass when uh, Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. 
So the opponents are there. Their threats are, are really coming now where they're getting in position to act on them. The novelty was gone. The unbridled excitement of a new project was gone. It seemed at this moment to Nehemiah and those with him that all hope was probably gone. But Nehemiah made some key decisions at a key moment in his life that changed everything. As courage was leaking in his life in this moment, he discovered how to get it back in. And as we look to this text today, we find some great lessons that we all would do well to get a hold of. Here's the first lesson this passage has for us. Number one, revisit your devotion. Revisit your devotion. Now, in week one of this study, we started where we had to start as we studied the life of Nehemiah. For him, it all began with prayer. That time with God. He, he was a man that had a heart to pray. He had a life who was willing to fast, setting aside worldly uh, uh, pleasures for the sake of focusing on God. He had a heart that mourned for the needs of those around him for four months. He, he prayed. But I want you to understand that for Nehemiah, it began with prayer, but he prayed all along. It wasn't like an invocation, that prayer that is, is given at the beginning of a thing, and people never do come back to it again. No, I want you to know for Nehemiah, it commenced with prayer. He didn't do anything before he prayed. And then when he started doing things, it continued in prayer. And ultimately, it culminated. It all came together in prayer. Nehemiah said, God, I'm getting ready to do something. I need your mind. I need your direction. I need you to help me. God, I'm moving now. I told you I was going to move, and that's what I'm doing now, and I, I need you even at this moment. God, I've got this obstacle, this critic, this opponent. God, I'm looking back now on what you just did. It's pretty awesome. What do you have for me next? Prayer was just a, a continual thing with Nehemiah. And in response to all that was going on in his life, in verse 9, we read this. Again, understand the context. The threat is there. He says this, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them night and day. All right, Nehemiah, you're being threatened. It's frightening. Courage is lacking. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to go to God in prayer, and I'm going to do what I know to be right to do. I'm going to go to God in prayer, and I'm just going to keep on doing the work that I know needs to be done. That's what he did. I think of the psalm I've probably quoted more than any other, Psalm 56, 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And friends, when courage is what you lack, go to God in prayer, and at the same time, keep doing what you know to be right. That's what Nehemiah did. He, he took the time here to revisit his devotion to God. He had no idea how it would turn out, but he knew the value in prayer. He saw the wisdom of being cautious and, and being very uh, mindful of what's happening around him. And in that moment of discouragement, he found that revisiting his devotion to God began to stir his life in a way where that courage could come in. Revisit your devotion. Here's the second lesson we'll see here. Remove your distractions. Remove your distractions. You know, sometimes in life, things pile up, and it makes it so we either can't see the job clearly, or it makes the job look larger than it is in reality, and, and the courage goes. Um, how many of you have tackled during this corona season any home projects? Any of you out there? Good. We have as well. We had quite a few projects going on, and, and uh, uh, the, you know, the economy's had a hard time, but they say like Lowe's and Home Depot, they're, they're doing great because most people are at home with a little more time on their hands, and they're wanting to paint or fix things up, and, and we've had quite a few projects, but the, uh, the last one that we had was to clean out our garage. Now, I got to help you understand our garage. We've lived in our home over 22 years. We've never been able to get a car in our garage. In 22 years. Now, before you criticize me too much, our garage was like the church office when we were getting started, okay? And then it was church storage, and then we've let a lot of people over the years store their stuff in our garage. But I've got to be honest, when all that stuff finally got out, man, we had a mess in there. It had just been a place where we'd walked in and set stuff down for too long. And uh, Lisa said, Steve, we got to do something about that garage. I agreed. And uh, man, just to, just to open the garage door and just stare at that was overwhelming. And... Um, and that's when we rolled our big trash cans around. And we just started going to town. We threw stuff away that I was pretty sure we'd never need ever again, you know? Um, like trophies from a tournament where we were consolation champs in the sixth grade, these kinds of things. And I thought, well, my kids will want that. No, my kids don't want it. Your kids don't want your junk either, okay? So 
we just got in there, and I'm telling you, we just started throwing stuff away. You know, before long, we, we got rid of the distractions and looked at the job that was before us. If you saw our garage, Jeremy, I showed you my garage the other day. It, does it look like I have mental problems by what you saw in there? I'm telling you, we cleaned it so, thank you for not answering, at least out loud, and it's hard. I sense him saying, I thought that, no, anyhow. Uh, man, we went out and got matching bins at Costco, and we got a label maker, and if you were to walk in our garage now, uh, one whole wall from floor to ceiling, everything's labeled, and we got Christmas and, and, and Thanksgiving and all kinds of stuff. And uh, what happened? We had to get rid of the distractions, a job we've been avoiding for probably years. It was a job that we were able to tackle when we said, there's too much distracting us in here. Let's get rid of the distraction. I'll show you the word we use for it in this verse 10. It was rubbish. All right. Look at verse 10. We read there, and Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. They couldn't get around. There was so much trash messing up the work site. They, they just couldn't get everything done. It was clouding their vision of what the future could be. That's what distractions do. But there was something even more dangerous, insidious, even happening here. In verse 12, we read it this way. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times. All right, what was said ten times? From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. So they heard ten times about these threats from their enemies. I want to submit that probably that was nine times more than they needed to hear it. I'm not an advocate of living in the dark, of burying your head in the sand, of not understanding what's going on around you. But if you have anyone in your life who wants to give you the same bad report ten consecutive times, it can be distracting. It can become overwhelming. At some point, what you need to do is remove the negative voices and the negative influences that would keep you from moving forward. Nothing will suck the courage out of your life like a continual negative report. Even in the book of Romans, Paul, speaking to the church, said it this way. He said, I beseech you, and that's a very strong word. This wasn't just some casual advice, something you may want to try out. He said, listen, I am begging you, brethren. He's speaking to people of faith. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Now, there was a corrective reason for this, to be sure, but there's also a very practical reason. He was saying, in a sense, remove the distraction, that which would prevent you, which would slow you down from moving forward. Now, to, to the bleeding heart among us, and I've got a heart that bleeds, believe me, uh, I can feel deeply. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about being unkind. Most of the time, what I'm talking about doesn't even require a word. It's just a decision to remove ourselves from that which would distract us. When COVID got going, I, I, I felt like, what in the world are we going to do at our church? And I'm sure you can apply that to your scenario, and you know too. What are we going to do? None of us ever lived through anything like that. And uh, so everything shut down. We didn't know anything about the virus. I'm like, okay, that's what we got to do. And uh, it didn't take me a week to figure out this is going to be a thing. And I'm not exactly sure what to do. There's a conference call where a bunch of pastors got together and they were going to uh, kind of talk and share ideas and so forth. And I thought that'd probably be a good thing. And, and so I got on this conference call and it was fantastic. It was, it, you know, pr we prayed and ideas were shared. And, and I began to formulate some ideas that were built on and changed along the way. But it kind of got the wheels turning once again where I was just like perplexed. Like I have no idea what to do here. It was a great call, and they said, you know, we ought to do this again next week. So I jumped on the call the next week, and, and uh, again, it was very helpful, and, and that time I noticed pastors were already aggravated one weekend, and, you know, a few complaints, and some of the things they're facing, and, and about the third week, it, it became a time for people to say, well, I'm mad at the government for this, and I got someone being mean to me about that, and someone about this, and, and it, it kind of took a negative turn. Here's the thing. I agreed with the complaints that were being shared. But I just didn't need to submit myself to a phone call every week where there was going to be nothing but what it turned into be, a time of complaining, a time of grumbling. I remember the afternoon I went home, I told Lisa, I said, Lisa, you know this call? She knew, and I said, I don't think I can be on that call anymore. It's just such a total bummer. I, I, it started, I got off the call, I felt edified and encouraged, and, and uh, it was good to feel like I'm in this with some other people. But I said, now, it's just like continual negativity. Listen, my week is too short to give an hour of it to have people for me to volunteer myself to a situation where I'm just going to get negativity dumped all over me. 
So I had to remove myself from that distraction. Now, thank God there are good friends in my life I can bring in to uh, kind of help along the way, people with good attitudes. But l- listen, if, if you expose yourself to that negative influence day in, day out, week in, week out, that distraction will prevent you. It will pull courage out of your life. Remove your distractions. Here's the next lesson we're going to pick up together. Number three, remember your desire. I love this one. Nehemiah did something incredibly wise in the midst of of these threats. Look to verse 13, if you would, please. He said, I even set the people after their families with swords, their spears, and their bows. Look down to verse 14. He said, remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and find for your brother and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. And in all of this, Nehemiah is saying in a sense, hey, don't forget why we started this in the first place. He's saying, remember your desire. We're doing this for our families. So you're there with your family. We're doing this for our community. We're, we're doing this most of all because it's God's will. And he was reminding them of the desire that was there in the beginning. You know, a lot of times we talk about how we do what we do, but there's a more powerful question to consider than how. It's the question of why. When that motivation is nailed down deep in your heart, it will bring courage your way. I think of David as a teenage boy. His dad calls him and says, hey, I want you to take some food to your brothers. They're they're in a battle right now. And David said, all right. He got up early, took care of his responsibilities. He walks into a valley called the Valley of Elah. And and as he gets there, he sees a giant of a man named Goliath standing in the midst of that valley. And and he's, he's literally mocking God and the people of God. And he sees his brothers and all the other troops on the side of Israel. And they're over there trembling in the bushes. And so David walked in and said, what's wrong with you guys? You bunch you cowards you have no courage that's not what he did he didn't point out their lack of courage you you, you know what he said is there not a cause he said guys don't forget the cause this guy's mocking our god we have a cause. He, he was saying without saying it, you know, there are some things worth living for. There are some things worth fighting for. If needs be, there are some things worth dying for. And he said, what you need to do, you need to go back in your mind's eye. You need to remember your desire, that great cause that God has given to you. I talk about it probably too much, but I generally talk about my sermons, things I do all the time, and then the big things I do. And um, so years ago, Lisa said, Steve, it's time. And I said, great. Time for what? She said, time for you. Get in shape. Lose some weight. And uh, apparently she likes me, wants to keep the ticker ticking. Uh, Hey, I got to tell you, I'm one of these weird people. I am so excited to go to heaven. I have zero fear of death. Zero. Honestly, zero. When coronavirus came around, it's like, oh, no, I might die. I didn't think that at all. I I was like, all right, bring it on. I'm ready to go. But uh, I know God's got a time in mind for me, and I want to live my life the best I can all the way to the end. And so uh, exercise, I saw the value. And I used to think... Of people that exercise, they're wasting time. It's just all about vanity and all the rest of it. And um, the Bible says there's little profit in exercise. So, I mean, there is a little profit. You can't deny that. Literally, that's it's right in the Bible. But I thought, you know, if I do that, I'm wasting time and life's too short. I need to make sure I'm giving time where it can best be used. You know what I learned? Actually, if you exercise, it makes the rest of the time better. You're sharper, you have more energy, and I thought, all right, I'm going to do this. This is good. So I made a commitment. I'm going to do it. I told you last week uh, all the times and all the rest, and I won't get into that anymore. But um, for me, exercise was done at a gym with the stuff in the gym. That's how it is. I'm, I'm such a creature of habit, you guys wouldn't even believe. Exercise for me is something I did in that place with that stuff. Then coronavirus came. Gyms closed down. Then it was open. Then it was closed down again. It was an emotional roller coaster, folks, I'm telling you. <laughs> but, but I literally had to think, wait, I exercise, but I do it over there with that stuff. And, and like for a minute, my brain got stuck, and I'm like, wait, I do this, but I can't. Y- you know what I realized? I was thinking too much about how I did what I did. I needed to take a deep breath and say, wait, why am I doing this again? Oh, yeah health, to have more energy for the rest of the day. And I had to remind myself, you know, how I do it. I don't have to do it how I did it over there. You can, I don't know if you guys have tried this before. Did you know you can go outside and you can like walk around? (laughs) Do a run if you want to do that. I mean, thankfully, most of our bodies have some weight, right? 
body weight exercise. If you can do a push-up and a sit-up, do a few of those, you'll be in the top 10% of most in shape people on planet Earth. I mean, it's, it's not really that hard. I had to get back, not to the how do I do this, but wait, why do I do this again? And when I got that desire re-anchored, I said, all right, let's adapt, improvise, and overcome here. Let's go ahead and make this happen. That's a great way to look at it. Now, I want to say today, I can't imagine or begin to understand what all of you are going through in your lives. But wouldn't it be great today if you took some time to go back and remember your desire? for your marriage, for your children, for your walk with God, for the love the Lord would have you to share with others. When we get discouraged, our thoughts gravitate to the immediate. Friends, listen, if you're listening, say amen. Amen. Pressure is temporary, but quitting in the midst of pressure all too often, quitting all too often becomes permanent. And we seldom think of the unintended consequences of putting up our one-man tent on the side of the highway of life and crawling inside, getting in a sleeping bag. Let's say you're super busy and feeling stressed out. Is there anybody in here that's busy in life? A few of you? One, two, thank you. Three. Okay, the rest of you, just talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to talk to these two real quick. Let's say you're busy and stressed out. Anybody stressed out in the course of life from time to time? Good. All right, so you're busy and stressed out. And you're thinking, oh, man, I've got so many uh, burdens, I'm stressed, busy, schedule's full, tired. I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. I had an idea. I'm going to skip church. That's what I'm going to do. Now, thankfully, none of you guys did that today, okay? That would be awkward right now, wouldn't it? You'd feel feel funny about that. But you say, all right, I'm going to skip church. And uh, the immediate gratification is I got to sleep in a little longer and maybe I got to watch a little more of a game or whatever it is people do on Sunday mornings so you don't go to church. And, and th- the immediate sense of gratification is, you know what? That was not a bad decision I made. Tired, stressed out, and here I am. I got more rest and I'm relaxing. I feel better. But, you know, there is an unintended consequence that comes from withdrawing from the fellowship of God's people, time of worship, time in the Word. Did you know... And you can snopes me and check this out if you'd like to. Did you know that Gallup did a study recently and it confirmed that all Americans suffered from stress during COVID? However, there was one exception to that rule that permeated every segment of society in America. The only segment of society that didn't suffer undue stress through the coronavirus season were those who worshipped weekly. They went to church. Sometimes we pull away from things because of the stress in the moment. But what we don't realize is, hey, we're missing out on something good that's going to come later on in the course of my life. Now, that's just an example of making a quick decision in the moment of stress, not seeing where it can lead. I'm saying today, remember your desire. Remember why you started in the first place. And that leads to the final lesson we'll see here in this text. In verse 15, we find a lesson that we need to renew your dedication. Renew your dedication. The Bible says, and it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught that we return, all of us, to the wall, everyone, unto his work. Sin comes to the point where he said, all right, it's time to renew our dedication. We're just going to have to get back to it. The Bible says, we returned to the wall, to his work. I'll forego the part in this text that would help us to see what they worried about never came to pass, okay? Uh, but what I will emphasize here is the fact that I think their real victory was not just over the opponents who brought threats their way. I think the real victory was over their own hearts as they were in crisis at a lack of courage and they were discovering from the Lord how to get the courage back in. It was not convenient. Uh, It wasn't easy. But what they did was worthwhile because it was the right thing to do and it was God's will for their lives. Now, I want to ask you a very pointed question. I want to be as direct as I can possibly be. Plain talk is easily understood. I shall now use plain talk and give you a question. The type of question which you don't answer out loud. You think about. I learned to have to say that sometimes. It's getting some awkward answers in the past, all right? Here's a question that I want you to think about in your heart. And before I ask this question, if you're a believer, God the Spirit resides inside of you. And He will use this question to put His finger on an area in your life that needs some courage. Here's the question. What have you stopped doing in your life that you need to begin doing again? 
these people came to the point where they had to say, you know what, it's time for us just to get back to work, to the wall, keep this thing moving forward. What have you stopped doing in your life that if given the opportunity in a conversation with God, he'd say, you know, you stopped doing that. I'd get back to that. I would do that. Maybe you've been discouraged, and I don't want to make light of that which would discourage or take the courage out of your life. I don't want to make light of that at all. Uh, I do want to emphasize God is greater. We need to remember the Lord. Uh, But maybe you've gone through some legitimately difficult things. Wouldn't it be great if this process were followed in your life and, and you could leave a service like this today or a season like this in your life and, to use the expression in the text, return to the wall? Get back to the big project God has for you. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Renewal is a work that God does, but it's always preceded by a decision on our part to humbly come to God and say in a sense, Father, I'm scared. I need courage I don't have. And let God lead you through a process that will bring you to the point where the the confidence you have in God is greater than any fear you would have in anyone or anything else. I don't know where it came from exactly. I, I think I've had a pretty consistent work ethic in the course of my life. When I was just a little tiny guy, had a push mower, and I'd do yards, and I saved up and got a lawnmower with a side bagger, and I did yards, but you weren't cool in the lawn business if you didn't have a rear bagger. So I saved up and got the rear bagger, <laughs> and uh, I, I was mowing lawns and, and making money, and, and I learned something to be a truism in my life. No mun, no fun. More mun? More fun, all right? So I figured out, if you got money, life can be more fun, more interesting. And uh, I, I always worked. I never was without a job. Uh, I remember one, one summer uh, in, in uh, high school, uh, I, I worked uh, 40 hours a week that summer in a machine shop. And uh, uh, that, that was tough, tough work in there. Uh, at night, I'd deliver pizzas. On, on that Saturday, I would work for uh, a painting company, uh, painting apartments, and I just worked all the time. And checks would come in, and it validated something in me, and it made me feel a sense of security and a sense of worth. And I erroneously concluded early on in my life that life ultimately was about how much money could you get, hold on to, and enjoy In fact, when a wealthy person dies, we often say, how much were they worth? As though their intrinsic value as a human being was wrapped up in what their account balance said, or a ledger sheet. So I thought, well, it's all about money. Now, I want to say this. I'm not against making money. If you got a job, you go there to make money for your employer or for your boss or if you're self-employed, whatever. Make money. It's not bad to get money. When it gets a hold of you, you're going to have a rough road ahead of you. It's just the way it is. So go, go for it. Go big. However big you're going now, go bigger. But I thought, all right, the ultimate scorecard in life is money. That's how you evaluate a life well lived. Who has the most money? So, started working, 2021, doing pretty good for that stage of life. I'm not boasting. It probably wasn't great even compared to where you were. But for me, I thought, this is pretty good. And I I got so important that... uh, well, this might be bragging a little bit, but it's for a sake of a bigger purpose. I got a pager. <laughs> Do any of you remember pagers? Yeah, some of you young guys are like, what? What are you talking about? A pager is what we had before everybody had cell phones. You, little thing you put on your belt. They were so important, only doctors had them, okay? And me. Doctors and me. Because I was winning. And uh, people would call you, and they'd, They'd put a number in there, and you'd pull over and go to a phone booth. How many of you know phone booths? Phone booths? Okay. This might have been a bad idea, but anyhow, uh, you know, I thought I'm, I'm winning in life because I now have a pager. And, and then I had, and probably you don't even remember this, it was such a short time that it was popular, but I got an alphanumeric pager, which was like some massive thing you'd hang on your belt. And the way that worked, if people called that number, a human would answer, and uh, th- then they would receive the message, they would type the message, and it would show up on your alpha- alphanumeric pager, uh, you could read it. It was kind of like texting before everybody had cell phones. So I'm like, oh, all right, I got a, I got a pager, but I got to get the alphanumeric pager now. And then, and then it was like the cell phone that had a handle, because you needed a handle, it was so heavy, and you know, and uh, then the new one would come out, and it was like just one thing after the other, you know, you never could get ahead of it. You always were behind it. Got a new car. 
then the new model year came out, and it's like, there's nothing worse than having a new car that's already, you know, the old model style. And I began to realize that this pursuit of mine, based on a goal that money is the scorecard of life, it's a game you never win. Nobody wins. I, I had to have a shift of thinking where it was like, life's all about money, how much stuff you can get. And I, I truly began to think, you know, I want to be a part of something that's bigger than me. Because I'm not very big. I, I want something to be bigger than me. As I drew closer to the Lord, it became truly a heart that thought, God, help me to be a part of your work. I want to be a part of something that's so amazing. The only way to explain how it happened was the power of God. I had to make some changes in my life. Changes in the way that I was thinking and you know what I've learned about living for the things of God and something that is so big it can only be done by the power of God? I've learned it takes courage, something that leaks out of our life. And yet God in his word teaches us how to be encouraged. We're going to face things every day that can rob us of courage. Some of you are going to go home today or to work tomorrow and you're going to encounter a situation that seems to take the courage out of your life. But, but just imagine with me today, just, just imagine with me today, what if we revisited our devotion and said, you know something? Man, I fear. It's on me. But, but I'm going to revisit my devotion, stay close to Jesus. I'm, I'm going to spend extra time talking to him. I'm going to spend that time in prayer. Imagine if we remove the distractions. You know, there's a lot of rubbish, just garbage piled up in my life. It's time to push that out. There's some continual negative voices in my, I got it already. I got it. I had it the second time. I don't need it 10 times. I'm going to remove that distraction. And, and listen, I'm not trying to be unkind, but, but some of you, it's a toxic relationship. You're under no moral obligation to submit yourself to someone who tears you down every moment of your life. I, I think maybe it would say, you know, that relationship's one I need to distance myself from. What if we remembered the desire that got us going before the tough time came? And imagine if we renewed our dedication when we felt weak and said, to the wall, to the work. I'd imagine if we did that, courage could come in that would enable us to continue pressing on for God. Courage, ultimately, for the believers, the awareness that God is greater. Say, He's greater than what? You name it. He's greater. And Nehemiah would have stopped halfway through if he hadn't come to understand at some point in his life. When the courage leaks out, here's how you get it back in. Our Father, we're Thank you so much for joining us for this service today. It's really our prayer and desire that God would allow these times in his word to encourage and help us. And if that was the case in your life today, we are grateful for that. The Bible teaches us that really the most important thing in life is knowing that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's something that's on your heart and you have a desire for more information about that, we would encourage you to email us at pray at coastlinebaptist.org. We'd love to respond by forwarding you some information that I believe you would find helpful, and we would be more than happy to pray with you about any needs you have in your life. Again, I'm very thankful you've joined us for this service, and I'd like to encourage you, at some point in the near future, why don't you make plans to join us in person?